Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Our gracious Heavenly Lord, we're so amazed at who you are. You are Jehovah Sid Kinyu. You are the banner over us. God, you protect us, you guide us, you lead us. You are our Jehovah Kana, which is the, our God who is jealous. You're a jealous God. You want no other gods before you. Oh, Father, you're our Jehovah Rapha. You're our healer, physically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what you do, God. Those are just a few of the qualities we see in you tonight. And tonight, uh, we're going to see the providence of God. The providence of God working in miraculous ways to remind us how you work behind the scenes doing amazing things in ways that we could never anticipate. So I pray tonight you will open our hearts to scripture as we actually study a book of the Bible. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. On March 7, 2012, Benjamin Netanyahu came to Washington, D.C. and met with our president. Quite unlike is going to happen next week, as a matter of fact. When you meet here on, when, on Tuesday, they will have, he will have hopefully spoken before our Congress. Anyway, three years ago he came, and when he came, he brought a, pres a present to the president. Does anybody know what that was? Now, my guess is they always bring presents to each other. If you've ever been to the libraries, you see those. But this was a very special <coughs> present. What was it, Michelle? It was a scroll from the book of Esther in the Bible. Why would, our, why would Benjamin Netanyahu bring a scroll about Esther to our president? He brought this scroll to our president to show our president a, an ancient situation where Israel, where God providentially stood up for the Jews and protected them from the Persians. Now, who are the Persians today? Iran. So what he was saying to the president is, God protected us from Iran before, and he will do it again. Will you help us? I mean, that's in effect what he was saying. Will you help us, or will we have to depend on God? Because God will do it. He will not allow his people to be destroyed. That was three years ago, folks. Two years before that was the first time I'd ever done a show on Iran's nuclear weapons. So for five years, we've been extremely, I mean, we've been uh, at a, a DEFCON 5 level, four and a half level for five years. And of course, before that, I've been going on for 20 years. Now we're past DEFCON 5. I mean, we are right there. And our president isn't even going to meet with Benjamin Netanyahu because Benjamin Netanyahu is gonna stand before Congress and say the same thing that he said for years, and that is, we must stop Iran from getting nuclear bomb. Israel first, the European powers probably second, United States third. That's what they're gonna do with their nuclear weapon, and that's what Benjamin Netanyahu is gonna say. So I wish I was gonna be here, but we'll hear, it. we'll hear the Israeli side of the news next week after you get it, and we can compare notes when we return. So tonight I thought, uh, and by the way, Benjamin Netanyahu speaks next Wednesday, March 3rd, to our Congress. Do you know what starts on Thursday, on, um, excuse me, speaks Tuesday, March 3rd. Do you know what starts on Wednesday, March 4th? Purim. Purim. And what does Purim celebrate? Why is it celebrated and by the Jews? That's from the book of Esther. That's when God providentially protected the Jews from the Iranians, or the Persians specifically at that time. So tonight, since I'm not going to be here next week, right before Purim, I thought, what better thing than to actually walk through the book of Esther? Because it is so applicable to us today. Now we have to remember when we read it, it is history. It's a story, uh, but there's, there's factual truth to it. I mean, it's not just a story. It's historically proven to have occurred, the many of the things that we're going to talk about. But the application for today is mind-boggling. 
Now, I'm not saying that this book of Esther is a prophecy about today, times. I'm not saying that some of the correlations that I make are prophetic. I'm just saying it's going to be real interesting as we go through this book to see some of the correlations with what's happening today. I don't believe there's any accidents with God. So if you have your Bibles today, open them to Esther, chapter 1. In the last couple of weeks, I've been talking a lot about current events and not as much as about the Bible. Tonight, you're going to get more about the Bible and less about current events, but it does all match up together. Now, as we, be, we begin the book of Esther, obviously, it starts in chapter 1. I'm, we're not going to read every single verse. There are a couple chapters we will read through because they're necessary, but I'm going to kind of jump around. And in the process, um, we'll uh, stop and talk. Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Now, it took place in the days of Ahasuerus. The, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. provinces. In those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel of Susa. Now, I love the way that this just immediately lays out the timing and the location. So really, this is the main thing we have tonight on our overhead, because it's important for you to see a map. When he reigned over 127 provinces, these are provinces of the Persian Empire. Ahasuerus is a king of the Persian Empire. He reigned from 486 to 465 BC. So clearly, almost 2,500 years ago. Now, as you can see, this is a large territory. It's all of the Middle East. It's into Egypt and Libya. It goes into Turkey, part of what was known as Asia, even into Greece. It goes up into Thrace over there and Macedonia up into Greece. And it goes all the way over to India. It was a huge country. They reigned over Israel from 538 to 331 BC. That's just over the land of Israel. Uh, their territory was, they had reigned earlier than that. But they were defeated in 331 B.C. by whom? Anybody know? Alexander the Great, who was a, what, what nationality? Greek, a Greek king. So this is the land of Persia. Now, you see here, uh, it doesn't, you wouldn't recognize it, but here it says Shushan in, in red, right where that pointer is. That's the name of the city, Susa. So if you know, um, if you know your territories, what country today is Susa in? Iran. It's in the country of Iran. So we have here this king. He's also called Xerxes in, in different parts of the Bible as well. as His Greek name is that. He's called that in other parts of um, history. But we have here that this king now is king over all the kingdom. We have the timing of when it takes place, sometimes between 486 and 465. And we'll get a better idea as we go along. Um, and he was reigning specifically. He had four capitals. But here, when this is happening, it's happening in the capital of Susa. All right, right here in the, what is current day Iran. It tells us that in verse 3, when did it happen? When is this book written or started anyway? The third year of his reign. So we know it's 483 B.C. That's when this book starts. It's 483 B.C. And he gave a banquet for all of his princes and attendants, the armies of the Persians and the Medes, the nobles and the princes of his provinces, being in his presence. And he displayed the riches of the royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for how many days? 180 days. Now, can you imagine a 180-day banquet? I can't imagine what that would cost. Why would anybody have a 180-day banquet? Show off? Well, you know, it kind of sounds like that because he's talking about the riches of his royal glory. So it kind of sounds like he was. Let's go on, verse 5. It said, when these days were completed, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. So he has this this huge um, opportunity for all of his people to be together for 180 days where he displays everything. And then he has a seven-day banquet for all the people. So if he's showing different people different things during the 180 days, these last seven days, 
Everybody's there. All the people who were present at the citadel in Susa, from the greatest to the least, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. That's where he had this. Now, if you know anything about history, and this gives us an idea of why maybe he had this. This took place in 483 to 482 BC. We know historically that he went to battle against the Greeks from 481 to 479 BC. So most historians will tell you that he had this particular event and banquet to bring everybody together to plan to go against the Greeks. And so he had all of his leaders, all of his noblemen, it said, all of his soldiers, everybody together to make the plans to go to war. Now that makes sense. Makes sense that you'd have everybody together for 180 days in a banquet like that. The final banquet was probably, you know, the, this is it now. Okay, let's go out and get everything ready for battle. It's probably what it was. Now, it turns out, according to verse 9, that at the end of this banquet, well, in verse 9 it says that Queen Vashti, his, obviously his wife, also gave a banquet for the women in the palace. But verse 10 tells us that the king was having a really good time. Because on the seventh day, what happened with the king's heart? It was merry with wine. So it said he commanded the eunuchs to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princess, for she was beautiful. Makes sense. What did she decide to do? She refused. Now, what does it mean when you refuse an order from the king? <laughs> and depending on who the king is, she said, off with your head. It's not something you did. When the king made a command, you went and did it. So why would Queen Vashti not go to this event to meet everybody? Because of how clearly we know he was drunk. So he was probably acting inappropriately. And if he was drunk, you can imagine all of his people were drunk. So who knows what she'd be going into? And is the queen going to devalue herself enough to go into something like this? So that, you know, that's one possibility. Any other ideas? Oh, she didn't know what to wear. <laughs> Actually, that, that's interesting because that's part of a problem that it could have been because they really probably didn't want her to wear anything. She, because of her beauty, would have been asked to come in perhaps naked. Because what is she wearing according to this? Her royal crown. That's all it says. So it could have been, I mean, it really could have been something. That's kind of funny. Now there's another possibility here. Because, folks, I'm telling you, you just don't disobey the king. You just don't do it. Okay, she said the king was demeaning her just by all the activities that were going on. And if, in fact, she was to be naked, we don't know that, but if she was... And all, you know, drunk and all the things demeaning her. Well, there's another interesting thing that, you know, we don't know the answer, but it's just kind of interesting to wonder. Because this woman had to know that this was the end of her reign when she did this. She had a child in 483 B.C. And this took place sometime between 483 and 482 B.C. Now, those of you women who've been pregnant, uh, you know, how would you like to have to go stand either naked or even not naked, sometimes right after your baby's been born, and entertain, perhaps belly dancing, perhaps naked, entertain a bunch of drunk guys when you have a figure that you have after the baby's born. So, you know, we don't know, but that to me makes a lot more sense than anything else I've ever heard of. Simply because you never refuse the king. You just don't. But the fact is, she refused him. Well, that started an uproar. <gasps> oh, king, if you allow this to happen without taking care of it, then all the women are going to rise up in the kingdom, and they're going to treat their husbands like Vashti treats you. And all these guys were in, a, in an uproar. So it says here, um, as a matter of fact, in verses 16 on, it says, In the presence of the king and the princes, um, Mamukin said, Queen Vashti is wrong, not only the kings, but also the princes and all the people. Verse 17. The queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husband. Verse 18. The queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all the king's princes, and there will be plenty of contempt and anger. 
In other words, the women are going to follow her, and then there's going to be an uprising. So they had a solution. Verse 19. If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let it be written in the laws of the Persians in the Media, in the laws of Persia and Media, so that it cannot be repealed. That Vashti may no longer come into the presence of the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. Okay, two things. One is they want him to make a decree. What does a decree mean? What did a decree mean in the laws of the Medes and the Persians? That's right. Could never be reversed even by the person who wrote it. So the king couldn't sober up in the next couple of days, come back and say, oops, I made a mistake, and erase it. He couldn't do that. Those are the rules at that time. Uh, and not only that, but he, they said, we're going to make this decree that you're going to give the royal position to somebody else. Now, you know, if you look at it, <laughs> Clearly, that deals with the problem, but doesn't we deal with the issue? You know, right here, we, we see the immediate problem, but we don't really have a lasting solution because the king's going to wake up, and he's not going to have a queen. So, as it turns out, verse 21, this word pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as it proposed. So he sent letters to all the king's provinces, provinces, and he said, every man should be the master of his own house and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. In other words, I'm making this decree because the man is to be the master of the house. Okay? He wanted to make it clear to everyone that Vashti's behavior was not allowed and these are the consequences for her behavior. Now, she could have been killed. So this is a lot better than what it could have been. But clearly, she's ostracized now as queen. Now, chapter, if you have any comments you want to make, raise your hand. Or if you have anything you want to add, please raise your hand. As we go into chapter 2 now, we, we've seen the first two, two major players. And who were they? Okay, we have King. Uh, we have King Ahasuerus. And we have Queen Vashti. However, we now know she's gone. So we're going to cross her out. But she's a major player. There's a lot of major players in this. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what he'd done and what had been decreed against her. See, he had regret after that happened. Um, now, it's interesting because many scholars will tell you, based on the timing that we're going to see here, that after these things didn't mean the next day or the next week after the banquet. It meant after the whole war with, Egypt, with, um, with Greece was over. Because he had his mind on the war. So he went to war. He did what he had to do. He lost the war, by the way. Um, but, he, um, but a lot of people think that this waited because the timing here is going to be unique. It says in verse 3, uh, the... Um, Actually, verse 2, the king's attendants who served him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the providence, that they may gather very beautiful, every beautiful young virgin to the citadel to Susa. And I read that and I thought, How would you feel if they came to your city and didn't take you? <laughs> Every beautiful young virgin. Okay, now. <coughs> so, the guys, you're left with all the ugly ones. <laughs> and let their cosmetics be given to them, it says in verse 3. Verse 5. This, this pleased the king. He thought this is a good idea. So, what happens in verse 5, it says, Now, there was this, at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai. He was the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, of what? Benjamite. Okay, so it's giving his pedigree here. Who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the capti captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Very specific details and timing here. What they're saying is Mordecai was, here's his pedigree, and he was taken into captivity in 597 B.C. We can prove that historically and biblically. But they were, said several words to say that. Verse 7. He was bringing up Hadassah. That is Esther. Hadassah is her Jewish name. Esther was her name that they were using then. 
his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her in as his own daughter, and he treated her like a daughter. It says in verse 8, So it came about when the command and the decree of the king were heard, many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai. That Esther was taken to the king's palace, into his custody. And it's important because what we learn in the next verse is she found great favor with this eunuch. Now, why would that be important? Yeah, he would promote her. If he liked her, he knew all the king's likes and dislikes. He knew what was important to the king. He knew how to prepare her so that she could be a queen and someone that the king would favor. He had the inside scoop, so to speak. And he liked her, so he was willing to train her up with what he knew. Uh, he provided her with cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Uh, now, that'd be pretty tough. You know, we don't even talk about that part of it. But just think of a, of a king sending out to all 127 provinces and getting the most beautiful young virgins of that place and coming in and getting one night with the king and then they go into harem forever. I mean, that'd be horrible for the women, but it's also horrible for the guys because they have nobody to marry. I mean, that's a tough situation. It's amazing that the people didn't have an uprising on that, but they, they didn't. Verse 10, Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Hmm, what do you suppose is going on here? Why would Mordecai say, don't make it known who you're from and what you, that you're a Jew? Yeah, the Jews were captives in this land. They were taken captive and brought here in 586, well, first in 722 by the Assyrians, and then again in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. And now we're in, give or take, 483 or 482. Actually, it's probably more like 479 uh, B.C. And the Jews, they're, they're not Persians. They're Jews. They're captives. They're, almost, they're not slaves, but they are captives. Okay, so, how would you, do you think God wants you not to admit that you're a Christian? Do you think God wants these people, if you heard about it today in Syria, who are kidnapped by ISIS because they're Christians? What if the Christians over there denied being Christians? To save your life, which is what it amounted to for them. You know, it's... Uh, we have to be careful not to point the fingers. It's very easy for us to, to quote a scripture that says, always be ready to make a defense for the joy that's in you out of 1 Peter. In other words, always be ready to share Christ with other people. That's easy for us to say. Um, are we supposed to deny Jesus? Absolutely not. But do you think that probably most of the Christians, in, if there's any left now, in Syria uh, are out waving a Christian flag? Or going to church on Sunday morning? Probably not. But that doesn't mean they're willing to uh, give it up. I was telling some people last week that when I was in Israel years ago, I met this wonderful man whose name I won't tell you. Uh, he was an older gentleman. He was at the Christian embassy. And everybody had told me he was a believer. So I, I used to, from Israel. So I was talking to him. He had been a major, uh, one of the highest up generals in Israel. And so I was talking to him and Got in great conversation. I said, well, tell me, when did you accept Yeshua Mashiach? How Mashiach is your Lord and Savior? And he just kind of looked at me real strange, and he didn't say anything. And So I kind of, you know, we talked some other things, and I kind of backdoored it around. To, well, tell me about your life and your walk with God. and You know, all these other things. And he just wouldn't even talk to me about that. And finally, he made this very cryptic statement that says that, and he said something like, um, the Jews that are in Israel that announce that they have become believers are ostracized by most people in the country and therefore they have no ability to help anyone else whereas anybody who becomes a christian who does not publicize that has the opportunity to do a lot of good things in israel to further the cause now i'm putting some words in that he didn't say but you get the idea what he was saying is right here 
He didn't make known that he was a believer because he could do a lot more for the cause of Christ by people not knowing he was a believer than by them knowing he's a believer. So each one of us has to evaluate our situation as to what the Lord tells us to do in any given situation. Because I would, you know, I would say I would never give up Christ and I would never deny him. That's, that's a given. But could there be a time when I just won't say anything? Because God doesn't want me to for some other reason. That's what happened here. Yes, Netanyahu still has Bible studies in his home and in his office. Uh, but those are Old Testament studies. Bible studies and Christian Bible studies are different things. There's no evidence, uh, evidence that Benjamin Netanyahu is anything but a Jew. Uh, but he does study the Bible because his son is an expert in the Bible, and that's why he started studying. Well, anyway, we have to be careful because when we look at that, we go, this verse 10, we go, boy, that, that grates me because Jesus says we're always supposed to be public about our faith. And we are. We are. So you've got to be very careful if you're going to be private about it that this is what God's calling you to do. And we're going to see something in a little while that will explain this to you as to why Mordecai would have told her this because one has to question why he would tell her that. Verse 11, every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she feared. So he was always right there at the king's gate. That's Mordecai. He was a respected man, at least by the Jews, so he did business there, but he was always there to see how Esther was faring. Verse 15, at the end of verse 15 it says, Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken by King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month Tebeth, in the 7th year of his reign. So this is 479 B.C. That's why we think this whole chapter started after the war with Greece. The king loved Esther more than all the women. She found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Do you think that was a mistake? Do you think President Obama is president by mistake? Do you think um, Ayatollah Khomeini took over Iran in 19, the other one, in 1979 by mistake? Do you think it just happened and it escaped God's notice on any of those things? No, it did not. And this didn't either. And we're, uh, we're going to find that out in a minute. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.